the second session we organize in uh, technology related to DLT. I see some of the first who attended last session, yesterday's session about what was mainly focused about the regulator and how DLT can, from the RDI perspective, research, development, and innovation, can work closely with the regulator to see how we can solve various challenges associated with such a new relatively technology that can have a huge potential to solve some of the critical problems that we are facing. Today, Today we will uh, shift toward uh, more toward the metaverse, not as a buzzword, uh, everybody talk about it, but mainly from how we can utilize this as a platform to address a lot of challenges, not only from finance sector, but a lot of area that can really DLT make a big challenge, big, big potential to solve such kind of problem. We have two kind of uh, presentation uh, today. Let me introduce the first kind of speaker and thanks for uh, you agree to travel to be with us on today. Uh, Dr. Vesta will start the first presentation. Uh, I think we can have the two presentation, then we'll open the floor for the third question. Please, thank you. All right, good morning. My name is Brunel. Uh, I'm trained as a bioprocess engineer, and I became very passionate about water and sanitation, and became frustrated and disillusioned with that, dropped everything, moved to a farm, and decided, how do I fix this? My um, journey began in 2018, where I thought, how do we connect all the different things? You know, I was working with smart cities, water sensitive cities, but it just wasn't working for me. Um, so today I want to tell you about my journey into the metaverse. I want to start with definitions that make sense to me. So I trust in these. I feel that they beat the hype. Um, and then I'll work on different areas of excitement because I realized there's some things that I'm excited about and others aren't. And I wasn't sure why some people were talking about the metaverse when it wasn't what I thought it was. And so I finally figured this out. So I'm excited to share that with you. And then with that comes some areas of concern, which I'm sure many of you also feel that little nervous knot in your stomach. Um, and then I want to share with you what we decided to do about that. So it's called um, Peduncle. It's a very early stage project. And then I have like three pages of resources that um, you can go through. So it's a lot. I'm not going to explain a lot of the things because I don't know what your interests are. It's on this website. It's already on the website if you want to um, look at it. And um, whatever conversations come out of this, if you want to follow up afterwards, um, I can post the resources there and you know that's, that's the go home page. And so if I work a bit fast over things and you're not quite interested in it today, feel free to go back afterwards and contact me and we take it further, all right? Okay, so firstly, the definitions of the metaverse. The first one that I came across was something called the magic verse. So this was in 2018, 2019. And it was this picture by a company called Magic Leap. Um, they're not doing that well, but they are focusing on VR headsets. But what I loved about them is these layers that you integrate mobility, energy and water, health and wellness, communications, and also entertainment. So it's not boring, it's not ugly, it's beautiful. And like the one thing I said after 2018 is if I'm gonna do stuff, I'm going to have fun with it <laughs> because academic life is not fun. Research is not fun when you look at how the world is. And so I love that these were all integrated. So for me, this emergent system of systems, to me, embody what the metaverse is. And if we talk about the areas of excitement, this will fall in the digital twin realm. Matthew Ball, I think, is the utmost leader of metaverse work and research. Um, he's a venture capitalist, but he's just so good at explaining everything. Um, so the link at the bottom is a short 14-minute video explainer, and he also has a book and a series of blogs. So any level of depth that you want, I highly recommend him. He has this huge definition. This one's a small one. Um, but it's basically, he thinks the metaverse really refers to the infrastructure. So it's not the virtual worlds, that's a small component of it. It's a combination of technologies that allow a bunch of things. And I'm not going to go through all of them. They're here. It's very diverse. Um, I think the only thing I want to tell you from here is that you need a hell of a lot of computing power. It's 3D. You want unlimited users, real-time rendering. You know, it's not baked like a movie or a game. It's persistent, which means when you leave and come back, it's still there, so you need to store all of that. It's synchronous, which means that you and your buddy that's far away work or play together, it needs to work. You can imagine the level of power, like internet, infrastructure, everything that you need to make this work. And so that's what I want you to take from this 
um, definition. The EU Blockchain Forum wrote a very nice report. Um, I really particularly like the first 12 pages, um, where they explore the different definitions. And what they come to, what the common thing is between these definitions is the technology-driven shift. This movement between linking the physical and the digital. And so really that's what we're talking about, is this shift into whatever this metaverse thing is. The important things are that it has impact through persistent and adaptable digital experience, whether that is work or play. I am particularly interested in the open metaverse, and so that also needs to be interoperable and accessible to anyone, whether you have a smartphone, a little sensor box, anything. Okay, so Matthew Ball ha also had several categories, and when you look at people like, oh, I'm busy with the metaverse, okay, that's great. So what I would suggest people say, my wish, is that when you say you're busy with the metaverse, categorize, are you busy with the hardware? Are you developing wearables? Are you working on the networking, like 5G? Or, you know, the mobile phone companies really are pushing this last mile. Are you working with the computing power? Are you working with the virtual platforms? I think pretty much all of the ones that I'm seeing when they say they're doing the metaverse, they're developing a virtual world, not the same thing. Are you busy with interoperability standards, payment rails, or the content assets and identity services? And where the blockchain links, I think, is in the last three in particular. Um, but Coral will tell you more about how that fits. <laughs> then, <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> then um, in that report, I also found this um, layers, this image from John Radoff, where he lays different layers of the metaverse. So you have the categories of are you using the hardware or the you know, infrastructure. But there's also the experience. How does it look like when you go in there? The discovery, what are you... What are you going in there to learn? You know, how does the ad content work? Because if you're going to give me another pop-up ad in the metaverse, I'm going to switch off. Like, you know, we have all this potential. Do not give me a pop-up ad. I'm fine with that, but make it good. Um, the creator economy, which is, is really promising to help. And then spatial computing, um, which is where I'm really interested in. Decentralization, which involves the, the blockchain. Um, the, yeah, okay. <laughs> Coral will come back to this picture, I think. Um, human interface, and so that's the wearables, the sensors, the watches, the, um, everything like that, and the infrastructure. Okay, so, so in all this, I found there's three major areas of excitement. I'm very excited about most of these. The first one is what we call the digital nationhood, you know, where people are like, the way government works these days isn't working for us. How do we create this nation in, in the metaverse? I'm excited. Okay. okay. Then <laughs> the second one is digital twins. So that comes back to that ma magic verse image, um, and that also involves AI, where you mo um, measure and interpret and process the sensors or, or the information that you get, and then the IoT, Internet of Things, where you collect all that data. And then the third one is this infrastructure, the next generation of the web. So with the digital nation nationhood, we're trying to avoid both the perils of captured state regulators, and I think as African nations, we know what that means. We know how powerful the, the external powers are and how powerless we are to decide our own destiny. And corporate self-regulators, this, this corporate creep and, and corporate capitalism, you know, all of that, so how do we get away from that? So that's a huge movement, and I think when it's blockchain and Bitcoin-related metaverse initiatives, this is what they're talking about. And so there's a couple of um, books and initiatives that talk about that, the network state, Liberland is that flag, um, the sovereign individual, and then I went down a whole micronation rabbit hole if you want some entertainment on my Twitter thread. Digital twins is what really inspires me, and I could have spent an entire presentation with pictures here, and I decided just to dump those four <laughs> links there. Um, the EU Inspire is a directive that's ended already, but that is about how to get different countries to connect their data and their spatial data infrastructure in a way that is interoperable. And if we can extend that to the whole world, that'll be fabulous. I think that's really a good initiative to try and follow and um, link with and perhaps duplicate for, for Africa. Then they have a new um, project, the EU Destiny Project, which is really about creating a digital twin Earth. The CSR in Australia has this um, terrier, it's a whole globe with all the data that you can do, and it is a fantastic project. Um, I visited or I attended the talk where the guy 
who was one of the core developers, um, exp expressed this, and everyone was just blown away. It is amazing. Please go to it. And then the really cool thing is that our um, Earth Observation Agency um, has Digital Earth Africa. And I really hope the CSR is involved with this, and if they're not, they should be. Um, and that is based on the same software. And so you already have that interoperability potential. And then just for the record, of course, there's also virtual fantasy worlds. And there my favorite is a new um, Averti platform. It's a fork from Second Life, but it's completely open. Um, and so we hope to work with them. Then the third infrastructure, which is also really big, and I don't have enough of a knowledge about this. And so I'll just leave you with a quote there from Bill Vass. Um, and I found his podcast very interesting. You don't have to believe uh, or agree with everything. But it's this wholesale optimization of the commuting, computing infrastructure. To me, that's what the metaverse is. Um, and it's also a convergence between gaming, simulation, retail, AR, VR, movie, research, all of that coming together and being interoperable. And you can play with the one thing and then work on the other thing, and it's all just together and easy. OK, but this also brings many areas of concern. I love and I'm very excited about those areas of excitement, but I just get this nagging feeling that it's not being done in the right way. The first one is with this digital nationhood, we also have this promise of an unjust enclave where the rich people, the elites, get to live in their little bubble and exclude everyone else. Technology has already changed the global order, but it is changing the nature of both companies and states themselves. And who are we missing? What if, like, what if I can't get in there? You know, what if it's, it's just like it's not right and we can do this better? Why do we have to take all the problems of the real world and put it into the metaverse? Why can't we just start over? Like, it's all open, right? So let's do that. Um, and it's also, like we said yesterday, the fact that like blockchain is being incorporated into regulation stuff, does that mean that Web3 is being co opted into corporate capitalism? It just it makes me feel uneasy. Um, and so I'm still very early on in this journey, but I love reading about Cory Doctorow's stuff and uh, Brett Scott. So, you know, if this is something you want to learn more about, I recommend you read them. Secondly, it's great to have a digital twin, but what does that mean for surveillance? You know, I'm busy reading Edwin Snowden's book, and like, this could be done so much better, so much just, more just. Um, and so there's clearly issues about privacy cyberbullying. And so the quote here is, the generalized, persistent, and adaptable nature of the metaverse will only compound existing issues with big tech and the financial system. And we heard this from LA, um, yesterday in the blockchain session as well. We can do this better, guys. Like, we've got the technology. Oh, so, and then the infrastructure lock-in or exclusion. You know, let's say you have to have a Facebook headset. You have to have a Facebook login. You, they manage all your data, and if you don't have that, you can't buy bread. China's already doing this. And so it sounds great because if you're a good citizen, you, you know, have your volunteer points and you have your credits. But what if you make a joke that somebody didn't like or misinterpret it? <laughs> credits are gone, you're done. And we see this already. So there's this possibility of discrimination. You know, we talk about inclusion, but isn't it really absorption? And then when someone doesn't want to be part of that, it gets portrayed as that you missed the boat. You're being left behind. When really, there are some of us who reject the direction of travel. And we deserve, as our human right, to have an alternative. Uh, and then there's you know, the small issue of heavy energy use. When you want to 3D render things into photorealism, and a lot of the blockchain applications, that's a lot of energy. We need to think about this. Um, there's some cases where it's important, but don't try and use it for everything. It's just not going to work. So I looked at these things and I got quite frustrated. Um, and so I was like, well, I'm going to design something that works for me, specifically for middle-aged women, because I think we're underserved in the gaming environment. Um, and so we just started this project, there's four of us, um, Peduncle. Peduncle is the eye stalks of a snail. It's the slow exploration and gathering of knowledge that then gets processed in your brain. So it's a virtual space where knowledge is visual, created with solid data and free software. And so I'm going to skip through this quite fast. Um, OK, but so I told you I wanted something where I could link up sanitation and housing conditions and road infrastructure and stormwater, all these smart city stuff. But where I get to say what data goes in there, 
what happens to that data? Because during the drought, um, I was doing my water research right in the middle of Cape Town's drought. And people asked me, what do we do? And I'm like, I have 20 year project plans for smart cities. That's not going to help me. We're running out of water next week. What do we do in our streets, in our houses, in our communities? Why do we not have access to the tools and the data that can make that happen? And so really, this is about facilitating bottom up decision making with the data to support that. And the first talk I gave there was in 2019. This is a screenshot from that. And the talk is in my resources. So we're doing that with a semantic web, which is not the same as Web 3.0. Like, I don't, there's a Web 3, Web 3.0. This is the semantic web. And on my website as well, I have an example of how this looked like you know, in the, the text. It's a specification for decentralized data storage, where users own all their data. Not some of their data. Facebook's like, oh, you can keep your picture. What about all the other stuff? And they can choose who and how to share it. If you want to share it with your friend, it goes to your friend. It doesn't go up to a corporate server and then back down to you again. It goes to your friend. Um, so it's a secure, decentralized exchange of public and private data. Um, and of course, because it's a specification, different applications can use the same data. And so that is interoperable by design. My friend Jonas is working on a solid box, which is a little server that works on the solid specification, has the software to run a sustainable system, um, and the hardware is a little box, which is a sustainable machine. Um, I've linked there to him as a speaker, and we're still working. <laughs> He's a coder, so nothing that you're going to see is pretty, but it's real, and there's a lot of data out there, and I really encourage you to go look at it. I'm really excited. Right, what I'm excited about is a light, low-poly geospatial visualization. So it's reality compatible. It's the real world, but it's not photorealistic because that's too heavy and it's ugly. Like, have you looked at Google? It's like everything's olive brown. That's boring. <laughs> like, I, don't want, I, want, I, want, I want fun and beautiful. And so it's, it's a bit of a twist on a realistic um, Earth. We're using 3JS, Terrier, Map Libra, OpenStreetMaps, Data Troubles, probably a lot of other stuff as well. And we're focusing on all three dimensional layers of the web. So text only, a light mobile applications you can use anywhere as well as this full-on powerful virtual platform, and they're all interoperable. Um, and that, I, I don't know, this is still, spoke about that in um, this year in Kosovo in July, which is also in the talk. Um, I'm very much an open source advocate, I suppose, because it is a way of life about solving common shared problems. And I think that's really, that's, that's a mindset that we really need to embrace. And what that means is that we create stability and trust through collaboration. There's a concept called subsidiarity, where we deal with issues at the most immediate level that is consistent with the um, resolution. Or oh, revolution. <laughs> you, you don't talk to government, the top tiers of government, to know what solid waste management you need to do at your own house. You deal with your community. But you also don't discard everything and look out for number one when you have a whole community around you that you also need to think about. So it's the most appropriate level. Um, and to me, that's the biggest problem with this permissionless, trustless, universal trust that blockchain does. Um, so it's really trust and interoperability through transparency. We are interested in a commercial layer for the Peduncle project, but we don't want to build that ourselves. And so that is separate from our project, but we do hope that there is a potential link with the CSR. Um, I spoke to Carl yesterday and then included this, that the payment layers also need to be interoperable with all of the layers of the metaverse, whatever you work with. And we also need this open source ethos in this payment um, system. And so what is the architecture that delivers that? And I really hope Carl will tell us more about that. So that concludes my talk. I just want to spin through the resources. So that top link is the website where you can find all that stuff. Um, it's just my blog. Um, more of that, more of that, and thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Oh, I didn't do the conclusion. Should I do that quickly? Those four? Okay. Just quickly, quickly, quickly. Sorry. Um, how are we doing for time? Okay, so there's just something I thought about this morning in my sleepless night. So what would I want the CSR to do with this information I just gave you? Please make all your code open source. You are at least funded partly by public money, so it should be public code. 
Um, please contribute your data in five-star format. Um, there's a website there, but basically it means don't put it in an Excel spreadsheet. Make it interoperable properly. Um, forget about blockchain. That is my personal opinion, and I'm hoping Carl can change that a little bit. But everything that, in my experience, and with all the people that I've spoken to, spent their entire lives on cryptography, privacy, decentralization, all of this, not one of them are excited about blockchain. Everything that blockchain promises to do can be done, and done better, without using blockchain. And further, blockchain cannot even do most of the things that blockchain promises. Um, so I would say start your journey with SafeNet. Um, and then please, if you don't work with the Digital Africa team already, please work with them. It's so cool. Okay, that's everything I want to say. <laughs>